Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to speak about the secret desires of content SEC. And um, I hope you're really still awake. It's always tough to be one of the, la the last speakers. I had, uh, last year I had 500 people in Singapore stand up and stretch for two minutes before my talk. So if you feel the need to stand up and stretch, uh, be very welcome to, to do that. Yeah, that's a great example right there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, um, as Monica said, my name is Rasmus Skjolden. She pronounced it almost perfectly. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, the lead product manager of uh, Magnolia, and, and I took over from Philip Berfus uh, only about four months ago, um, so I'm still relatively new at Magnolia. And as I also said to a couple of you, uh, this leaves me in the weird situation that I'm a product manager of a product that you guys know better than I do. So good luck to me. <laughs> so I, I live in uh, Copenhagen, I come from Denmark, and then I travel to Basel every other week, um, which is why I also um, am there quite a lot. So uh, I come from the content strategy, UX, and author experience perspective. That's really my background. So I'm not a developer in any way. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's pretty important for you to understand that I don't come with a technical perspective at all. So I'm going to talk about something quite different. <clears throat> um, so the, the lead product manager uh, job calls for a very generalist approach. Um, but today I'm not going to speak about uh, product management at Magnolia in general. Instead, I'm going to deep dive into a topic uh, that I've spent a lot of time on, which is reusable content. So um, again, I'm not a developer or technical, technical at all. So for someone like me, um, there are so many words that I simply, I, I know they exist, and, but ah, what is it actually? <laughs> I'm not so sure always. And as part of my onboarding process, I've also been told to speak to this guy, um, JCR. Um, so I haven't found him yet. But uh, that's what you have to understand about me. I'm really, really not technical at all. So, so what do I do? Um, I'm in charge of uh, product strategy and roadmap as the lead product manager. I co-author the product strategy together with Jan who presented some of the points uh, from that earlier today, and also together with uh, our CBO, Boris Koft. And um, <clears throat> I'm in the process of installing a new type of product management organization and processes um, in the group of product managers uh, at Magnolia. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. And in addition, <clears throat> um, a fairly big part of my job is really diplomacy because I am bombarded with um, needs and desires from uh, all corners of the universe about what, which direction Magnolia should be um, going in and what features are absolutely essential. So we obviously can't do them all, um, which is why I need to kind of apply a certain amount of diplomacy um, to figure out the balance and the direction for the product. So, uh, a very brief look at, on, um, on my past. Um, I started doing CMS or design of CMSs back in the late 90s. Um, and I worked with the open source PHP based Type of 3 CMS for many, many years, um, being the brand manager of Type of 3. And um, in the past couple of years, or three or four years, I was the UX lead of a, a new CMS project called the NEOS project that spun out of the Type of 3 community. In addition, I have uh, 18 years of uh, experience in digital agencies doing CMS projects, and I founded something called COPE, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, which was a, a content strategy focused agency in Copenhagen. So if you don't know Type of 3, uh, this is uh, 
what that looked like a couple of years ago. <coughs> Enterprise class content management, uh, still competing with Magnolia in the German market. Um, so it kind of refuses to die. Uh, it's uh, from 1997 or something like that. Uh, the founder lives right, right next to me, so I meet him in the street sometimes. It, he, it's originally from Denmark. Um, so uh, the Type of 3 community came to a point where it said, okay, let's rebuild the whole CMS. Terrible, uh, terrible, terrible, terrible decision, as always, as you know. Uh, to rebuild a very large piece of software from scratch is just painful. Um, but anyway, uh, seven years later, <laughs> We, uh, we ended up with the Neo CMS that was launched about three years ago, where we really tried to rethink uh, content management from the author experience completely. So uh, this is a screenshot of that. Um, and as I, as I said, I also founded a content strategy. Uh, how, do you all know that there is a field called content strategy? Yeah? OK. Okay, it's a fairly large thing, but many developers don't really know about it. So, but that's my perspective. And um, <clears throat> uh, at um, COPE, um, it, it stands for Create Once, uh, Publish Everywhere, which is the acronym that NPR here in the US used for their content management approach and kind of championed that uh, for many years. And, um, we were trying at COPE to mainstream that approach uh, because of my obsession of reusable content, uh, which I think is extremely important. Um, and in addition, um, we did a lot of consultancy work on organizational changes that could facilitate better customer experience management. And uh, we use new tools uh, such as Contentful and Gather Content to do our projects there. So, and Gather Content um, is what is um, what is uh, called a pre-CMS. So, and the way it works is, I don't know. Do you all know Contentful? Um, no. All right. Headless uh, CMS that is fantastic at uh, structured content, no presentation layer at all. So uh, gather content works like a, a, what is called a pre-CMS. So instead of uh, bouncing back emails um, and producing endless Word documents and, and assets in the file system, you take something called a pre-CMS, that's the idea, and then you structure your content production process in that, and you match that to your needs in the output channels in, for example, the CMS. So uh, while I was working with a very large uh, enterprise um, last year, uh, implementing a very large gather content um, project for them, um, their digital director suddenly had uh, some kind of an epiphany uh, because he was saying, you are basically de-siloing our organization with a tool. Uh, I think you um, asked something about how to collaborate inside the content management system across departments, and that was exactly what we tried to do there. Um, in fact, we, we kind of always showed this image to illustrate our, our approach. <laughs> So if you think of these three guys as different departments in an organization, the way that they're able to produce a quality experience is via a shared tool. So they have the mix deck, um, we call it the content mix deck um, at COPE, <clears throat> and they're able to use that simultaneously, uh, feeding in different sources of input, going out to different destinations. Um, and able to work together on that. So in addition, um, I'm quite fond of uh, this thing about the shortening lifespan of content, or I'm very interested in that topic. Um, so a few, a few years ago, I did a, an, an art project at the National Gallery of Denmark, um, where I, together with um, some photographers, destroyed their images in front of an audience. So that was kind of taking um, um, 
the shortening of the content lifespan to the extreme. And there was really um, <clears throat> no point. We just wanted to try out how, how does it feel like to see an image for the first time or for the, for the last time before it's deleted before you. So um, going back to something um, a bit more um, related to, to what I'm going to show here, um, my question really is how do we then deal with content that is dying from the moment of inception? And uh, what all this means is that I have um, a lot of um, experience with the pain of content chaos. We use that term uh, many times today. And <clears throat> um, I'm pretty sure I've tried everything when it comes to chaotic content processes in the past decade. So when I started designing CMSs, this was how it looked like. So this was Tiger 3 version, I don't know, 3 something, 336, many years ago. Um, completely insane uh, UI. And um, content uh, back in 1999 was produced something like this. So um, John sent something to Maria in a Word document via email and back. Th that uh, particular piece of content was then forked uh, by copy paste into an email mailed to the CMS editor, previewed, forgot, uh, forgotten, and then apply a few mistakes here and there, and then describe in a fo phone call what needs to change, directly in the CMS, of course, put online and change stuff again. So then three months later, um, someone says, we need to change the content, but where's the master now? So is it in mail, in Word, in the CMS? No one knows and which one was proofread and why there are now two versions of the same content in the CMS. You know the whole situation, I guess, probably too well. So, and what about translation, of course? It's a huge topic. So, speeding uh, forward to 2016, uh, what I typically see in uh, many different kinds of organizations is this content production workflow. It is exactly the same. And of course, granted, there are many, many organizations that do an excellent job today at producing content in high volumes, very structured processes. But in general, this is what I see all over the place, which I find quite interesting. And to make things even worse, when we then take three months for forward, uh, things have gotten worse uh, because why are the images now gone from the dam? <clears throat> why is the PIM data not consistent with what's online, et cetera, et cetera. So things have definitely been um, <clears throat> not getting better always. So a quick history recap. Now you, David, uh, you gave a, a pretty uh, very, very good um, history recap uh, previously today, but I'm going to do a very short one uh, looking at things from the content strategy perspective. So back in the 90s <clears throat> um, and early series, print thinking went into web design. This is an, an example of New York Times um, from, uh, it, it was the first uh, example I could find on the Wayback Machine from 1996. And because print thinking was carried into web design, CMSOs followed along and kind of implemented that thought of print thinking. So the first waves of CMS again tried to separate form and content, but at the same time, content was just tied to the output format, which is giving us a lot of problems today. So then enter enterprise needs and the CMS kind of expanded its scope and became ex exceptionally complex. And looking at the CMS space from a user experience and content strategy perspective, what happened was that things got so much out of hand in terms of complexity that there was a counter reaction asking for simpler authoring experiences. So things like in-place editing came along, uh, I don't know, six years ago or something like that. And we still see many examples of that in blogging platforms like Medium, for example, where you try to 
kind of make a great author experience in a super simple way. Um, but obviously there are endless problems with in-place editing, so uh, it's generally not a smart idea. And then mobile happened and the web uh, kind of became multi-channel overnight because suddenly you were able to access web content through, uh, what was it called, WAP or something like that on this phone. So <clears throat> mobile meant multi-channel, but a lot of customers had just moved from print first from back in the, in the 90s to web first. And um, that meant that CMSs put a massive focus on building web pages, which we've seen plenty of ex examples of today. And uh, we, that's all fine, and we all need site builders uh, to build web pages and, and do that in a great way, but it gives us a lot of problems when we're dealing with content reuse across multiple channels. So um, to make things even worse, we came up with the concepts of multi-channel and omni-channel. And <clears throat> now content needs to work in more and more contexts, obviously, as, as you all, all know. And you presented some really great examples of that earlier today. Um, so um, again, looking at this from the content strategy perspective, I'd like to ask what do cave paintings and printed books and web pages all have in common? And obviously, uh, that it, the answer is that content and form are completely tied together in those formats. And that still happens a lot in our uh, WCMS. So uh, we let authors produce content on a page, which means that they tailor the content to that very particular um, digital experience of the web page. And that makes it exceptionally hard to reuse the content when we let our content authors produce the content that way. So I like to think that um, I think we've come kind of seduced by technological uh, possibilities and our own ideas of what was possible or what is possible with the technology we produce. And content strategy comes from another place and looks at this space in a different way than most of you guys. So the problem is that we've somehow forgotten a few truths about um, our history of communication and our mental ability to connect with an audience. So um, from the viewpoint of content authors, um, what happens often is that content disappears. It, it's out of date so often. I mean, when you look at all the biggest um, most prominent websites in the world, it's so easy to find content flaws. And if you look on Twitter and search for never write in the CMS, <clears throat> you get a ton of results uh, from journalists, uh, typically that just, uh, they're kind of having a thing about never writing in the CMS. And now if you look um, down there, this is uh, someone from the New York Times and these are, there are tons of examples of that. Organizations that are supposed to have uh, stellar uh, content management systems, but still there are content authors are, they don't dare to write in, in the tool. So I definitely think we need to do something about that. So the proliferation of content and, and uh, content sources and destinations uh, is exploding, obviously and content is just constantly forked uh, and recreated over and over again. In, in fact, um, I think outdated information needs to be taken even more seriously because um, just think of um, there are pharmaceutical uh, industry examples of uh, side effects and dosage descriptions that were copy pasted from one publication system to the other and then some kind of weird error happened. Um, and we had an example of that in the Nordics uh, last year where suddenly uh, a large pharmaceutical company uh, produced um, an, a, a brochure, I think, which had copied, pasted uh, content from the website. And then all of a sudden uh, there was a lethal doses of painkillers for infants there. So uh, what I'm saying is that outdated information is not only an annoyance, it is actually quite literally dangerous. 
In addition, we're also seeing this tendency of done once and then discard it. So content is just produced quickly, discard it uh, just as quickly, which is fine for a lot of marketing content. But there's also a ton of content that could live on in many different contexts. So how do we deal with that? So I'll stop now with all the negative negativism here and uh, look at how to solve some of these problems. So um, the purpose of this talk and the headline, content wants to be free. So now I don't know about you, but um, I haven't talked to my content today. I don't know what it wants, what it feels, anything, what uh, the secret desires of it are. But so what, it, well, what am I actually asking? What, what does content want to be free from? And what I think is that content wants to be free from projects. Because the project format um, has a lot of uh, fantastic traits, like measurability, deadlines. It's very clear what the purpose of a project is. And that kind of makes us all produce content that is tailored for a very particular project again, making it completely impossible to reuse the content. So there are many organizations who are exceptionally smart about producing content in a reusable way, but still they are um, quite rare. So I think that projects are what kind of eats multi-channel content for breakfast. And to deliver what the field of content strategy is really asking for, uh, this is a key part of the problem, I think. So projects are kind of what trap reusable content inside the project scope, and content f has, a, has a hard time uh, getting out of that project format because it's caught in the InDesign files or on the web pages that we build or in the social media management uh, tool that we're using. Um, and I kind of um, think that content is somehow caught um, in the projects of the moment in many organizations. So here's a small news flash. Um, creating reusable structured content is super, super easy. There are tools out there or vendors that say it, they're doing a, an exceptionally good job on that, at that and that it's super hard, but it's really not. It's just taking a, a form like we've done in the web content management system world for ages and just letting authors uh, input content into a structured format instead of giving them access to an RT. So that's really not that difficult. But I think what is happening is that we've kind of gotten ahead of ourselves because some of the, um, the examples that we show about how to produce omni-channel experiences um, they kind of rely on the authors being able to produce something that is relevant. And it's one thing to technically say, okay, we can produce reusable content, but it's something very, very different and far more difficult to produce content that is actually perceived as relevant when it touches a user uh, across different uh, touch points uh, in a user journey. And that, that is not uh, uh, easy at all. So now back in 2013, I did this small uh, forecast, I call it. It was basically just a PDF on SlideShare, but it sounded better to call it a forecast. Um, and I asked uh, a number of industry experts about how they thought the web would be built uh, in terms of content management in 2017. So this is the list of people, and one of the most prominent ones were Karen McGrain, uh, who's a content strategist. You may not know her, but in the field of content strategy and UX, uh, she is um, God. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and read this out loud to you. Uh, I know it's a lot of text, but uh, uh, this has kind of been become a mentor for me, uh, something I've been trying to solve in the past years after she wrote that. So in the next three, three to five years, I think two key trends will dominate the CMS space. First, organizations will realize that WCMS doesn't always support true multi-channel publishing, and they'll need to invest in new systems to decouple the authoring and storage layer from the presentation and publishing layer. 
This might mean adding in middleware, developing new APIs, or even choosing an entirely new CMS. And she go, goes on along those lines. So there was some kind of a sign of hope there for someone like me um, that there, there can be a way to reuse content in a better way. We just have to figure out how to do that from the vendor side. And I think uh, so far the primary answer has been to improve the capability for multi-channel uh, via decoupling the authoring environment uh, from the presentation layer. And what that is, in other words, is a, is a largely technical way of trying to solve this problem. There's just one issue with that, which is super important to me. That is that safeguarding the connection, like the inherently emotional connection between author and audience in a world that is transitioning uh, towards multi-channel, that is super hard. Because you have to, as an, as an author, you have to think about how do I actually relate to my audience when I'm producing content that I don't even know the context of? That's really, really difficult. And for us, or for you guys, coming from a technical perspective, this is super easy. You know, this is just all about structured uh, content, about APIs, uh, but to authors, it's very, very difficult to emotionally connect to an, to an audience where you don't really know how are they going to experience this piece of content. And you have to learn a, 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 a long list of, of rules about how to produce content that is reusable as an author for it to work in the car example that you showed earlier today, Bill, or on the watches we wear now. So, uh, and we can't build preview templates for all of, of, of the context because we don't even know them. We're producing reusable content that can be used in you know, all kinds of future channels that we haven't even invented yet. So that's a major headache for the content strategy field and uh, author experience in CMSs. So I, I often return to the, this quote by a former Apple, Apple designer um, named Brett Victor who said that creators need an immediate connection to what they create. And he's done some fantastic experiments in this case, a developer tool where you could change the code and then the picture on the left changes uh, instantly. And what he says is that this kind of, uh, this way of iterating on content while seeing the preview immediately is what creates uh, really quality content. But again, you're see, seeing the dilemma here or the paradox that uh, strong touch point user experience versus the realism in producing uh, coherent omnichannel content and uh, making sure that it is not outdated and trying to save costs on production. That is just a, a very hard um, dilemma to solve. So um, let's face it, I think creating content has really become a commodity is quite simple to do and we shouldn't care that much about how you create content but instead look at how you curate content for different contexts. In uh, the forecast uh, there was this guy called Pietu Tollanen from Finland. He's a weapon CMS expert uh, at a company advising customers on CMS selection. And what he says was that uh, we need to spend more time in the CMS industry of figuring out how to moderate content streams rather than focusing on how to create content because that's kind of the easy part. So I took that as a challenge <clears throat> and I think there's, there's really a need for a very new, a new very basic pattern of, um, of creating and publishing content. So right now, we're still in the old school pattern of you, we let our authors create something, then we manage that and control that, and then we publish it, and that's it. Of course, again, um, there are many good examples of, of far more advanced uh, uh, publishing patterns, but this is like the 
basic, basic pattern that we're following again and again and again, which is not really working well for multi-channel. So what I tried to set out to do was to kind of bridge the, the user experience need at touch point level, which uh, demands uh, highly tailored um, controlled digital experiences in order for it to make sense for the end user and the reusability and consistency of content. So after trying out many different methods, I, I came up um, with this idea of dividing between core content and contextual content. And, and really, it is deceptively simple. Um, but there's, there are some gems hidden there. <clears throat> and um, I've tried this with uh, very large enterprises, very, very small companies, and everything in between. Uh, with pretty good results. So what is uh, core content and contextual content? So think of this as the, as the combined mix of content for a project. So on one hand, you have core content. And there you see content as a business asset. It's reusable, potentially long-term. It doesn't need to be, but potentially long-term content. And it's approved, it's proofread, translated, whatever and it can never be produced or live in the single channel or the uh, publication format of the single channel. Because otherwise you are basically um, asking your authors to tailor uh, what is supposed to be reusable content to a single experience. That doesn't work. On the other hand, you have contextual content, <coughs> which is the opposite. So there you have uh, the, the content that frames the reusable assets. So that's where your marketing departments will go in and say, OK, in order for this uh, core reusable content to make sense at touch point level for my end user, I need to frame it in this way. I need to curate it. Um, so there you have uh, authors that are um, creating content in the tone of voice of the channel or the platform. And it lives quite nicely in the publication system uh, of the channel or the platform. So there's your site builder, really. So I tried it out for uh, uh, um, an ISP in, uh, in the Nordics uh, because they came to me and said, we have the problem that uh, our core product descriptions are changing inside of our organization, which is kind of crazy to think about. But their, um, uh, their core product and the descriptions of that were kind of being changed uh, by the web editor because they, they wanted something shorter, so they cut down the text a bit. And then, on the other hand, they also had sales guys that also needed to use the product descriptions. And they were also changing the product descriptions because they wanted it to match the, uh, the particular pitch they were in. So they had diverging uh, product descriptions, which is really uh, the, core, the core content. <clears throat> so what we did was uh, to divide it into core content and contextual content. So some of it, this is just a touch point on the web. Think of this as a landing page. Um, so, and what is red is core content, what is gray is contextual content. So up here is a product name that is obviously core content. You cannot change the product name, which people actually do sometimes, crazy enough. Um, or you have product, re uh, product name renames uh, that then are not reflected everywhere on every touch point. Uh, but the headline is up for the web author to just produce. So that, that can be uh, created directly at the touch point level. So, and then we we're taking, going into a completely other touch point here, which is a sales contract, something that we're not uh, used to deal with, uh, to dealing with in the web content management space, of course. But this, this is still a touch point that we use as product description, so why not? And again, the content strategy field is really looking at content in a more holistic way. And we did the same. So what is really happening here is that we're mixing the reusable assets with the contextually relevant assets here and kind of weaving them together. So I thought, okay, let's try to look at how that could be done with Magnolia. 
And um, so I took um, content from three different sites. This is the weirdest uh, CMS content mashup you'll ever see. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but uh, this is just as an example. So I took uh, content from Excite, from Nissan's concept cars, and from the tile block. And then I asked uh, someone over in services in Basel um, to create, uh, there you go, uh, apps for that. So there's the Excite content, Nissan uh, content, and the tile content. So if I, uh, this is the Nissan concept car site, uh, the tile blog, and the Excite uh, website here. Um, so if I then go into one of these content apps, uh, this is the Nissan one, then it has just imported all of this content from the Nissan site and turned it into structured content in, in one of our content apps. So this is suddenly content that doesn't live on the page, but is uh, taken into the content apps uh, framework in, in Magnolia. So as an author, I'm not able to manipulate any of this. I just need to curate it. And uh, that's the same pattern for all three, uh, Excite, Nissan, and Tile. And then when I go into the page app of, of um, Magnolia here, here is basically a mashup of the, of the reusable content assets from the three different content apps. So um, if I then want to change uh, the Nissan product image here, I th then just uh, edit that uh, content, I get to select uh, the content from the content app uh, where I have all the assets from the site and then I have a new image. This is a just super, super, super simple. And again, there's nothing technically advanced here. There's no challenge in this for you, but from the content authoring perspective and the content production workflow perspective, it has a, it, it's a big, pretty big change um, compared to how you normally curate and, and create content. In the same way, um, I can take uh, the snippets and uh, the other parts of the uh, structured content and change that and kind of weave together what is core uh, reusable content assets coming from the different apps. So um, again, for someone like you, this is not a challenge at all. But if you look at it from this other perspective of content production workflows, this is a, a pretty big thing, actually. And what I can do here, uh, let me just return to this, is that I can use Magnolia's normal editing uh, abilities or functionalities to create the contextually relevant content. So I can put in headlines uh, over and uh, beneath and on the right and on the left uh, of the core reusable assets. So um, the ability to kind of curate uh, the touch point with those reusable assets and combine that um, is just the start of what I think could be a new pattern. And we can do so many things in the, in the uh, CMS to improve the experience of curation. Uh, so what I'm working on is to try to find this new kind of very basic pattern um, and um, what is important here and what I've been testing out with clients is that they can start to think about uh, content in a cross-project manner. So instead of just being hyper-focused on one project at a time, producing the content that is relevant for that particular project, they can start to look across their many different projects and produce content that is actually reusable across the different touch points. And it's very, very easy once you get into the pattern uh, and it's easy to do with, with uh, Magnolia and all kinds of other CMSs. But again, if you look at it from the organizational perspective, it's something new in, in, in many organizations. But it's fairly easy to implement once you get into the thinking. So um, I think, um, or what is important here is that I'm not asking for all content to be set free and become content atoms that can be reusable in whatever context because that would prohibit the possibility to do strong user experiences at touchpoint levels. 
And all the customers I, I talk to, they are also saying they want to tailor the user experience at the touch point, at the glass, uh, to make that super relevant. So, but weaving together gives you a possibility to, to do that in a new way. So, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.